Wow, this is something. I haven't seen it this full many times. So thank you so much for all being here. I'm really not good uh, when I read things from a piece of paper. I'm better from the seat of my pants. But anyway, I am Jessica Strand. I am the Director of Public Programs here and Strategic Planning. Um, before we begin tonight's program, in the spirit of reconciliation, the Los Angeles Public Library recognizes and acknowledges the first peoples of this land. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all indigenous peoples today. For those not familiar with the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, we are a private nonprofit organization devoted to fundraising, advocacy, and innovative programming, like this one, in support of the Los Angeles Public Library. Thank you to the Library Foundation supporters, members, and board members in the audience this evening. If you are not yet a member or supporter, I hope you will consider supporting the Library Foundation and to continue to see programs like this one and to increase critical access to information, resources, and technology to help all Angelinos improve their lives and to fulfill their dreams. You can support through, where is it? How weird. Well, there you go. All right. You can, you can actually scan this code on the screen um, and you can become a member very easily. Um, I'd also like to thank our generous sponsors and the estate of Susan E. Aaron, Errant Fox Schiff, Hearst Foundations, the Golden Globe Foundation, Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture, and individual library donors and members. Thank you so much. As we begin the new season of Allowed, we are also rolling out a new Allowed, one that is evolving and expanding in its scope. In addition to our popular author series, Allowed on Authors, we are adding Allowed on Ideas, this is a thematic series that takes a deeper look at subjects in the zeitgeist. This spring we'll be doing um, a series of three on artificial intelligence. Allowed in review, which will focus on a book or a theme, but will approach it in an unconventional format. It's more a cabaret than a conversation. And finally, Allowed in community, a series we will co-produce with select library branches each season. This is exciting and th a thrilling endeavor for us as we continue to engage longtime allowed audiences and welcome new ones, both here and in neighborhoods all around LA. I really, I, I'm excited about this and I've been trying to do it for several years, so please join us. And it all begins tonight with this amazing gift of a program between Rabbi Sharon Browse and Father Gregory Boyle. The season will also include Amor Tolls at the Wallace, poetry readings in the gardens at the Getty, a review looking at women writing about rage entitled Rage She Wrote. Please come. And to learn more about our season, please visit lfla.org backslash allowed. Now, to introduce our esteemed guests, I welcome the president and CEO of the Library Foundation, Stacy Lederman. Thank you. Thank you, Jess, and good evening, everyone. We're so excited to bring to the stage tonight two exceptional leaders, Rabbi Sharon Browse and Father Gregory Boyle, who through their words and deeds inspire us to lift ourselves and each other to make our communities stronger and better. It's fitting that we present them here at the Los Angeles Public Library, which is dedicated to enriching, educating, and empowering every individual in our city's diverse communities. Indeed, a spirit of possibility is in the DNA of our libraries, which are dynamic and safe community hubs where everyone is welcome and treated with dignity and respect. It's now my honor to introduce this evening's guests. Rabbi Sharon Brous is the founding and senior rabbi of Ikar, a trailblazing Jewish community here in Los Angeles. And full disclosure, Rabbi Brous is also my family's rabbi. 
She has been named the number one most influential rabbi in the United States by the Daily Beast, Beast, and she blessed both Presidents Obama and Biden at their national inaugural prayer services. Her TED Talk, It's Time to Reclaim Religion, has been viewed over 1.5 million times. Her work has been featured in the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, and the New York Times, including a beautiful op-ed this month. It was 15 years ago that I first heard Rabbi Brow speak, and I was amazed by exactly why we are here tonight. Her extraordinary ability to take ancient Jewish wisdom and make it relevant and resonant, not only to our times, but to our own lives. Often, she'll share a sermon that is just what I, or you, or all of us need to hear in that moment. With compassion, moral clarity, a commitment to justice, an expansive heart, the gifts of a natural-born storyteller, and a sense of humor, she nurtures and inspires community with hope and light and a fierce call to action. And with the publication of her first book, The Amen Effect, Ancient Wisdom to Mend Our Broken Hearts and World, her brilliance and courage will now reach a broader audience serving as a beacon and a guide for how to show up for each other. Father Gregory Boyle is a native Angelino, a Jesuit priest and the founder of Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, the largest gang intervention, rehabilitation, and reentry program in the world. After witnessing the devastating impacts of gang violence on his community, Boyle and parish and community members in Boyle Heights adopted a radical approach at that time to treat gang members as human beings. In 1988, they started what would eventually become Homeboy Industries, which employs and trains former gang members in a range of social enterprises, as well as provides critical services to thousands of men and women who walk through its doors every year seeking a better life. In addition to his community work with Homeboy Industries, Father Boyle is also a New York Times best-selling author of five books, most recently, Forgive Everyone Everything. He was inducted into the California Hall of Fame and named a 2014 Champion of Change by President Obama. He received the University of Notre Dame's 2017 Latari Medal, the, the oldest honor given to American Catholics. Please join me in welcoming our guests to the stage. Turn this on. There we go. Um, you got yours? The, um, it's a privilege uh, to be with all of you, but for me it's a, an exquisite privilege to be with Sharon. She's luminous, as is this book. How many of you have been able to read it yet? There we go. Um, so, uh, first of all, a disclaimer, I'm, I'm not Ezra Klein, so... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm new at this, and uh, I've been spending all day yakking at gang members, so, uh, so I'm, I'm particularly unsuited uh, to do this. But uh, I love this book, and it's, uh, it's, it's an elixir, so I recommend that you uh, go out and get it, perhaps even after uh, this moment. So, I, I, you know, it's probably, for those who haven't read it, and... Uh, and maybe you can explain a little bit about the Amen Effect and take it. Okay, first of all, hi everyone, good evening. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. And Father Greg, this is a dream for me. Um, I think that Stacy and I started talking about this event uh, before the book was written. And so it's really wonderful to actually be here in the LA Public Library. And to be here with you is an incredible joy. So I'm extremely grateful to you. And thank you to Jess and John and Tiffany and Stacy and the Library Foundation um, for, for putting this event on tonight. Um, thank you for giving me the chance to talk about uh, to talk about the Amen Effect with all of you. So. 
Um, so what was your question? <laughs> what is the, what is the, the title? Oh, yeah. Okay. So here's what the Amen effect is. Essentially, we are living through a time that is marked by the intersection of multiple crises. I'm sorry to start us on a downbeat tonight, but we're living through a crisis of loneliness, of social alienation, and of isolation, of political polarization, of ideological division. It is actually breaking us. It's breaking our bodies. It's breaking our spirits. It threatens to break our democracy. And when we are living through so many crises at once, it's very tempting to just feel incredibly powerless. Like, it's too overwhelming. There's nothing I can do to actually address all of the pain in the world and all the pain in my body. But the thing is, we're not powerless. We actually have more power than we think. And so the Amen effect is actually reminding us that one of the core superpowers that we have is the ability to turn to one another in moments of celebration, of sorrow and, and solidarity and say amen to each other's human experience, to each other's humanity. And that that can actually have a transformative impact on us, on the other, and also on our society. So that's essentially the, the premise of the, of the book. You know, we have a mutual friend, Vivek uh, Murthy, the, the Surgeon General, and he, you mentioned in here about how he has written about uh, loneliness as, as really a health issue. And, and, but he makes a point that's saying that it's not so much about being alone as it's a crisis of belonging. And that, so how it, so I look at Icar and, and if for me it's like, uh, it's like a tribe that stands against to, you know, sort of the end of all tribalism. It's a, it's a different kind of community that it's uh, the front porch of the house everybody wants to live in. So speak a little bit about belonging. Like how, what, that's kind of a qualitatively different thing than just, just only connecting to people who are isolated or alone. Okay, so we've learned a lot about loneliness in the course of the last decade or decade and a half. We've learned about it, really, it's, it's coming from the direction of science and medicine right now. And what we're learning is that the problem is not being alone, it's feeling alone. There are many people who we know who are the loneliest people among us who are always surrounded by people. There's that famous Janis Joplin line, like, I just made love to 25,000 people, but I'm going home alone right now. And, um, and so it's not actually about whether or not you're surrounded by people. It's about the quality of the relationships that we have in our lives. And Dr. Murthy, who's been writing so brilliantly about this, and by the way, how lucky are we that we have a Surgeon General who's dedicating his tenure to speaking about spiritual crises and speaking about what loneliness is doing to not just to our, not just to our spirits, but to our bodies and to the body politic. I love that. Um, but what he, the way that he defines loneliness is it's the gap between the social relationships that we have and those we need. And everybody has different needs. And so some people could have just two really great friends in the world and never feel lonely. And other people feel like they're constantly surrounded by love and friendship and family and they just are breaking inside from loneliness. And so what, what we actually need is to feel a sense of deep connection with one another a connection that is akin to or is actually about belonging. Um, I look back to um, the writings of Maimonides, the great medieval philosopher Rambam, and what he says is that there are actually uh, fun th very different kinds of relationships that a person can enter into. There, on the most foundational level, we have utilitarian relationships. You need something from me, I need something from you. And those relationships are fine, we shouldn't judge them, except we need to know that the minute the utility ends, the relationship ends. But relationships of belonging, relationships of real rootedness are the second and third type. These are relationships of mutual concern and worry. Like we worry about these people when, when we think that they're in danger. Um, we, feel, we feel greater joy when we're able to share our joy with them. Um, we, we love them. That actually, most great marriages fall into that sort of second category. And then the third category of relationship is a relationship of shared purpose. And that's when the two of you find some common cause that's bigger than either of you. 
and, and you pursue that cause together. And I, in the book, I really argue that the real belonging comes kind of at the intersection of two and three here. Relationships of mutual care and concern and shared purpose. And can we build communities where we care deeply about each other as individuals and we know that at the end of the day, we're trying to build something even grander than either of us or both of us um, in this world. And when we root in communities like that, we experience a kind of belonging that, that helps us find our purpose in life, that helps us feel like there's a dignity to our lives. And I would argue that that's so much of what you've been able to do at Homeboy and why, we're, why we all admire, why this place is packed tonight. Um, because, I mean, what you did was you essentially rehumanized you rehumanized an entire population of people and said, hi, they're human beings too. They deserve love and care. And they also can work, we can work together collectively for something, for something even greater than any one of us as individuals. And that's a very powerful model for community building. You know, I, I had an experience recently that I want to share with you and kind of propose a question. So I'm on a plane uh, flying from Philadelphia to Los Angeles. And I know your husband's from Philadelphia. And so I don't mean to cast any, anything on Philadelphia. <clears throat> but I had two homies with me, and I had an, uh, an aisle seat. And people were boarding. And I see a very tall man who has a T-shirt on. And I'm trying to read what it says. And it says, Philly is everybody. And I went, oh, my God. You know, exquisite mutuality, connection, human flourishing, uh, community of cherished belonging. And then the t-shirt got closer and it said, Philly versus everybody. <laughs> and, and I thought, shoot, we, we were so close there. <laughs> but, but how do we achieve this nobody versus anybody? And, and so that's kind of vexing in a way probably has always been, but particularly right now. Oh, so yeah. how do you address that kind of multi-layered problem? Yeah, it's, okay, so we, we are living in an incredibly oppositional moment in world history, right? I mean, we, I, as, I, as I write in the book, I, once a, a former teacher of mine once criticized something that I wrote that he didn't like, and he said, we literally no longer inhabit overlapping universes. Right, because my idea was like this far away from his. And so we no longer inhabit in overlapping universes. And so this is something that I, I spend a lot of time thinking about, Philly versus everybody, right? Uh, us versus them. And it connects to the tribalism that you're speaking about. Like how do you build a tribe without becoming tribal in a way? And so I, I want to address that, but maybe we can just take a step back for a minute because um, thank you to the a um, few people who've already read the book, but I want to just get, I want to offer kind of the central paradigm for the book so that we can use it for the rest of this conversation. Um, the book is actually rooted in one particular ancient ritual, which was a ritual from the temple times in Jerusalem um, when the people in that time, 2,000 years ago, used to go up on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And so Jews would come from all over the land and also from the diaspora. They would ascend to Jerusalem. They would ascend the steps of the Temple Mount. And then they would enter through this beautiful, um, elaborate entryway. And they would turn to the right and they would just circle around the perimeter of that courtyard. And then they would leave where they came in. That was it. So now imagine like hundreds of thousands of people all at once in this sacred work of circling. And it's so interesting, just to like sidebar for a minute, but I think about Resma Menachem's work on trauma and intergenerational trauma. And one of the ways that we address trauma is by moving together. And so many of our faith traditions have m shared movement. Like when I try to envision my own people's pilgrimage, I have to think about the Hajj because, they ha in, because Muslims have this movement around the the, when they make pilgrimage to Mecca. So they would turn to the right, circle around the perimeter, hundreds of thousands of people at once, just caught up in this mass of humanity, which has, which has real spiritual healing power to it, right? To be, to be caught up like that in the drama of a sacred act. 
except the text says, for somebody who has a broken heart, that person would go up to Jerusalem, walk up the steps of the Temple Mount, enter through the same arched entryway, but turn to the left, whereas everyone else turns to the right. And then they would engage in this sacred encounter that neither party wants to be in because the person who's brokenhearted does not want to show up in that place where there are hundreds of thousands of people and they're all moving in the other direction. Um, and the people who are having this ecstatic moment of prayer and connection, they do not want to encounter this poor guy who's brokenhearted, who's stumbling toward them. And yet they do have that encounter. And this is what the encounter looks like. The brokenhearted person is walking toward the person who's okay that day. The person who's okay says, what happened to you? How's your heart? Tell me your story. And the person who's brokenhearted says, I just lost someone I love, and I don't even know how, I, how to breathe without him. Or they say, my partner just left, and I'm completely blindsided. I, I did not see this coming. Or I'm really worried about my kid. Or I just witnessed a terrible act of violence, and I can't sleep. And then the person who's doing okay that day just looks at the person who's brokenhearted and gives them a blessing, a simple blessing, just one line. May you find comfort in your time of grief. May the one who dwells in this place hold you with love as you navigate your mourning. May the community embrace you through this time of heartache. And then they move on. And that's the whole encounter. And I just realized as I, as I spent a lot of time with this ritual, that it was basically an instruction manual for how to rehumanize ourselves in times like the times that we're living in now. It was written thousands of years ago, but it's actually written for us today. And what it's saying is that when we are broken and when we're, when we're struggling with loneliness and social alienation and lack of belonging, that we have to place our hearts in a, in a context of care and trust that we will be held with love. And when we're okay and we don't wanna pay attention to the people who need it the most, our primary spiritual and religious responsibility, our primary human responsibility is precisely to hold the person who's on their way, making their way against the crowd because the whole world's moving in one direction and they're moving in another and they are ours. They are our responsibility. And so that is what it means to actually be human, is to find our way toward one another precisely in those moments when neither of us wants to be in that conversation at all. And it also acknowledges, as you say, that the person who is okay today, for today, as opposed to we're all going to be in that other group where we're brokenhearted and this is a thing that we share. And, it's, and, and typically kind of what happens these days is people look at, at grief and pain and the brokenhearted and sometimes say, what's wrong with you? And so to unpack the, what happened to you? What, what, what's going on with that question? So first of all, it's a question, yeah. right? It's an invitation into conversation or relationship. It's not, I mean, actually, Oprah and Dr. Bruce Perry that wrote a book about this from a neuroscience perspective, which I found out about the day I turned in my manuscript. And someone's like, by the way, did you read Oprah's book? I'm like, oh my God. So they wrote a book called What Happened to You? Literally, because, I don't know if folks have seen it, but, but essentially when a, when a child who's traumatized, who's experiencing trauma at home acts out in the classroom, the, the response from the schools is very often, what's wrong with that kid? And it's about scolding and it's punitive, like our whole society is so punitive. Instead of saying to the kid, what happened to you? Be, and so w what would it mean to have a kind of tra a trauma based lens that we could engage that we can engage behavior um, with instead of a punitive lens and so what we're doing and I realized that the ancients were very they were incredibly wise they really understood this so what we do is we don't accuse someone else and we don't assume that we know what happened to someone else. Oh, so-and-so is here going this direction because they must have just lost someone. Instead, we stop, 
we see the person and we ask them. And that invites the other person to say, this is the kind of care that I need right now. I need, I need the care that one gives somebody who just lost their loved one, or I need the care that someone gives when they're engaging somebody who's struggling with, with a deep darkness, with a very deep depression, or this is the kind of care that I need. So it invites the person who's walking against the current to actually be a part of their own healing process in some way, to allow themselves to be seen. And I think there's power in that. Also, by the way, it's enough to even get out of your pajamas and get out of bed and show up in this place, but you're not allowed to turn to the right like everybody else. Because you have to show, like you are different in this moment. And what would it mean to create communities when, when we're different, we're held with love and not with scorn? And, and so you're actually saying, I need you to see me right now because I'm not like you. And I've had many people, I mean, we're both, we both pastor to our, to our communities. And I've, I've had so many people who've described in moments of grief and loss and struggle, it just feels like the whole world is moving in one direction and I'm moving in the other. What's wrong with me? And it's actually not, it's not what's wrong with you that sometimes the whole world is moving in another direction but you're bereaved. And so for a set period of time, you're gonna actually be walking in a different way. So it's about being seen, it's about asking and inviting a conversation, and then about sticking around for the blessing part, because the blessing is so crucial here. It's not just priests and rabbis that can offer blessings, but we can all offer blessings to each other and, and look at where the brokenness lives and then say, may you be held with love as you go through this journey toward healing or as you navigate this darkness, may you be held with love. And what is like the, and it's not the, the great priests of the temple who are giving those blessings. It's the people, it's just everybody. We can all embody that goodness. And what does it mean to be seen and asked and blessed when we're brokenhearted? What do we regain in terms of our dignity and our agency when those three gifts are given to us in those moments? You know, I think we, we all long to somehow find a way um, to understand that the answer to every question is compassion. And, and judgment is the thing that kind of impedes us. And you do this fascinating thing about curiosity. So could you say more about that? Yeah. So the last chapter of the book, um, I talk about not only what happens when the person who's coming toward us is brokenhearted. But the second example that's given in this ancient text of the kind of person who would turn to the left is not somebody who's just experienced a loss or is struggling with, with illness or you know caregiving for someone who's ill, but somebody who's been ostracized. And this is why this is such an important conversation to have with you in particular because of your life's work. Um, the ostracized. This is a category, it's called the menudet in Hebrew. And this was in ancient times, somebody who had in word or in deed so violated the norms of the community that they were one step away from excommunication. They were essentially um, socially distanced from the community. In fact, you're not even allowed to be within six feet of somebody who's in Nidui, who's in this category of ostracization. They're physically distanced. They don't count in a prayer quorum. You don't have, you don't invite them for dinner. You're not to engage these folks. Um, and yet, who walks to the left? In the text, it says, it's a very terse text, and I included the whole thing in the back just so that you could read it. But the text says it's the brokenhearted and the ostracized. And what happens when the ostracized walks in? They walk to the left like the brokenhearted. And everybody who's going in this direction sees them too and stops and looks into the eyes of the ostracized and says, tell me your story. What happened to you? Where is your heart? What does the world look like from your vantage point? And this person responds saying, I have been ostracized from this community. And they too are given a blessing. And that is, I mean, it is extraordinary because you imagine a person who you're not even allowed to engage in social in encounter with. Like literally before they got to the Temple Mount when they were all dipping in the ritual bath and eating their food and you're not allowed to engage the ostracized. But when you're in that sacred zone, you see them, you 
ask them, you honor them, you bless them. And they are blessed. And so what is, what is that text possibly trying to tell us? And, you know, I think about Father Greg's work and I think about Brian Stevenson's work. And I really think the two of you in some ways are the, like the two leaders of this movement of rehumanization saying like, who are you throwing away? Who are you calling disposable? This is just a person, right? And it seems like you are connecting to the wisdom of these rabbis who were writing 2000 years ago, who were like, listen, this is a person who actually, I mean, actually did something that harmed other people and puts them outside the boundaries of community. And even still, we see them. And, and so what are the kinds of spaces that we can develop where we can actually see people, where we can open our hearts with curiosity and with wonder toward even people who see the world very differently and in word and in deed may have even caused harm to us or to people we love can we see them as human beings again? And so chapter eight is called Wonder, and it's really about how to cultivate a kind of curiosity in which we can rediscover somebody's humanity after that kind of breach has occurred in a society. So we're all Angelinos, and uh, how, how, does, um, how do we imagine a circle of compassion, and how do we then imagine nobody standing outside that circle? How, how do we go from this place this evening and you know and honor and accompany and stand with the widow orphan and the stranger and how, how does that not in a programmatic way but in, at the end of the book you have you know a sort of how to practice you know and so what what would be your advice to people who live in the city who who already have a list of very vexing complex social dilemma that that we've find really hard to address. You know, how do we go from here? So this is why we put, my husband very wisely um, insisted that I put actual practices at the back of the book because I don't want this to just be a great sermon with lots of really good stories. I hope you think it's a great sermon. I don't know. I didn't want to just tell, I didn't want to just give a sermon with like some, with some stories and some, and some beautiful ancient texts. I want us to actually think about how we live differently. And I feel the fierce urgency of right now. I feel that urgency, and I think many of you do too, which is why you're here tonight. If we don't figure out how to find our way to each other, what does the next chapter of human history look like? What does America's next chapter look like? And so how do we, how do we translate really beautiful ancient ideas into day-to-day -day practices that can actually change who, who we are and how we see the world? And, um, and so for each chapter, there's a corresponding spiritual practice. I call it a spiritual practice. If you're not spiritual, it's okay. You can do these practices too. And um, so, and, and basically they all end up landing under the overarching, the kind of umbrella of just show up, just show up. Like your neighbor is, you know, ha had a, a loss and there's a funeral and you're busy and you're not that close, just show up. Just go to the funeral. You will never, none of you in this room have ever been to a funeral that you've regretted going to and thought that was a waste of time, right? You never regret going to the funeral. Just show up. Show up for the joy. Show up for the grief. Show up for all the in-between. Show up in service. Show up in curiosity and wonder. Show up in love. And so there are all these kind of specific w suggestions of how we can do that. I'll give you two. Um, one is actually from my, um, my beautiful friend Shifra, who I write about in the book, because Shifra, not only is she a great mentor and teacher and, and very dear friend of mine, but she had this incredible love story. She fell in love with this wonderful guy, um, and it was a love story that should have lasted until, like, old age, and he, unfortunately, after just a few years, was diagnosed with lung cancer, and he had a very terrible last few months and then died. And she, as Schiffer was grieving for this beautiful man, she realized that what she loved about Michael was that he was full of joy, that he was always smiling. He had, like, the best smile lines on his face, you know? And he was always, like, he was surrounded by dear friends, and he was always laughing, and he had the best stories. And she said, I don't want to just like be bereft. 
I don't want to be just like devastated and sad for a year as I grieve this beautiful man. I want to embody some of the joy that he held in his body. And so she literally established a practice where she would set the alarm for 18 minutes every single day. And she forced herself to have 18 minutes of joy while grieving her beloved Michael. And so she did all kinds of crazy things, like she would blast her favorite music and dance alone in the apartment. And she would go for a walk in nature and just, like, see something beautiful in the world. And she would eat chocolate cake and, like, visit a person who, you know, like, call an old friend. And she just allowed herself to grieve with joy. So, like, I decided in an act of solidarity that I would take on 18 minutes of joy to honor Shifra's grief also. And I, I think about it a lot because we feel guilty feeling joy sometimes when the world is so dark and when we're, when we're bereaved and bereft and worried. And so what does it mean to just give ourselves the space to actually allow our bodies to be filled with joy? And so that's showing up too, showing up for each other's joy and showing up for our own because we actually need to, we need to do that. I'm gonna give you one more example because I think that my neighbors, Francine and David, are here somewhere tonight. Are you here? Um, Okay, maybe not. Uh, I'm going to give them a shout out anyway. But um, but um, in in chapter eight, I talk about Hannah Arendt, the most you know brilliant 20th century philosopher. And Hannah Arendt says that the danger of loneliness and social alienation and isolation is not just what we've been talking about that it kind of breaks our spirits. But she says she says that isolation and loneliness are preconditions for tyranny, that tyrannical regimes cannot take hold, that conspiracy theories cannot take hold in a society in which we know each other and love each other. Because we hear things about other people and we're like, well, that doesn't check out in my relationship with this, you know, former gang member or Jew or black person or indigenous, like whatever the person is, if we know the people, then we're like, wait a minute, that doesn't seem right to me. And so, so essentially, we're, like the reason that this is such a crisis right now is because we don't know each other. And, and in fact, before COVID, the studies showed that 30% of Americans don't know their neighbors who live to the right of them and to the left of them. They don't know their names. And that 20% of Americans don't have one single person who they'd call a confidant. And so that's really distressing. And so essentially, so one day, I, it was actually the day after Yom Kippur, the, you know, it's a big day for Jews and especially for rabbis. <laughs> and so I slept in and I left my house a little bit later than I usually do. And as a result, I bumped into my neighbor across the street who I literally have been living there. We've been living in that house for like seven or 10 years, I don't know. And I never had seen him before because we were on different schedules. Jewels. And uh, we got to talking, and he's a lovely guy, and um, and he, I, we started talking about Yom Kippur, and he's not Jewish, and, and he asked, well, what did I preach about? And I shared that I was talking about these empathy studies that I was so fascinated by, and like the human heart, and mirror neurons, and whatever. Anyway, he is, uh, he is one of the authors of the study that I was quoting in my sermon the day before, and he lives across the street from me for many years, and we didn't even know each other. So one of the spiritual practices is take a walk around your block every week and say hello to your neighbors. And just, like, just introduce yourself to your neighbors and say good morning and, like, help your elderly neighbor bring their trash in and just, like, be in each other's lives because that could be our strongest defense against fascism, okay? Like, it actually matters. It won't only make you feel better and maybe make someone else feel better, but it will actually protect us against our deepest fears of what the future might hold. Thank you for that. Uh, I... Uh, Tiffany, I, you know, there are questions that were generated uh, prior to, uh, didn't I see you out there? And she was going to rush them up to me <laughs> because she didn't have them before. These are questions from, from uh, or we well, could do the old-fashioned thing, which is... Uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So how do you, I mean, I, one of the things I've learned most from you and your incredible books, which... If you have not read, I mean, I will say that Tattoos in the Heart was completely transformative for me as a, as a Jew, as a rabbi, as a, as a wife and mother. I mean, it helped me 
understand the human condition in a way that I had never before. So I, I want to ask you, when I mean, you write in that book th that shame is the heart of all addiction, right? And, and so how do you help somebody move from shame toward, toward healing, toward actually seeing themselves as worthy of love and connection and belonging? Well, at Homeboy, we, we think sh cherishing is kind of, uh, you know, systems change when people change. And people change when they're cherished. And so we try to create a culture of uh, a community of cherished belonging. So people walk through our doors and, and they're barricaded behind a wall of shame and disgrace. And the only thing that can scale that wall is tenderness. So you, you embrace tenderness as, as the kind of the connective tissue. Uh, otherwise, love stays in your head. But unless it becomes tender, it doesn't really connect. And so the, it's, so you talk so much about, about connection, and it's really about... Uh, you know, relational wholeness. How do, how do we walk each other home to something that's l larger, a larger love? And so, and every gang member who walks through the door comes uh, with what psychologists would call a disorganized attachment. You know, mom was either frightened or frightening. And you can't calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. So what I found so beautiful in the book was about it feels so simple and obvious to think that you, we need to see each other. But, but homies will say, you know, because they've been in prison for so many years, uh, we're used to being watched, but we're not used to being seen. And that's what your book is about. It's about really seeing people. And that feels like, you know, that's a hard thing to do because we're distracted. And uh, we're self-absorbed. It's kind of our, you know, kind of our default setting. But, but if you can really see somebody else, then you can be tender with them. Then you can cherish them. And cherished people are resilient. They're sturdy. Uh, and so I never say that I've ever healed anybody or transformed a life. But I know that transformation happens there. And I know that transformation happens in your community, that people are finding something because they're seen. And so you want to create always a place that's safe where people feel seen and then cherished. So I think that's kind of uh, the key. And one last thing, I, I, I remember I spoke at the LA Times uh, uh, Festival of Books. I was on a panel with Rabbi Rachel uh, Levy, who's a writer. Do you mean Naomi oh, Levy? Was yeah. it Naomi? Yeah, yeah. Did you ever think of Rachel Naomi Remen or Naomi, Rabbi Naomi Levy? Yeah, I don't know, but <laughs> she's a writer <laughs> and a very nice person. And Steve Lopez, uh, the columnist. And, uh, and I don't know. At one point, I, I said, you know, at Homeboy, we embrace two principles. One is everybody's unshakably good, no exceptions. And we belong to each other, no exceptions. And then I said, do I think all our social complex dilemma, vexing as they are, would disappear if we embrace those two principles? And I said, yes, I do. And the entire auditorium burst into laughter. <laughs> and I was kind of startled by it. And then when it subsided, I said, yes, I do. And I do. And I, I just think that somehow we've forgotten, you know, that we belong to each other. Here's one, because it's directed at you. Um, what advice do you have for increasingly disconnected teens who distance themselves from typical authority figures? and social structures, disaffected, kind of disconnected teens? It's, thank you for that question. First of all, that was gorgeous. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, so first of all, I, I, I do, I want to say something about teens having three of them. Actually, my oldest just turned 20, so um, two of them now. 
that it's, it's really hard to grow up today. It's really hard, and I think that there are, they confront challenges that we did not confront. Um, and I, the, just the temptations of these, of these devices, the noise in their head, the distractions. I mean, these tools were created to be addictive. And so how do you, how do you grow up loving yourself when the addiction is rooted in self-loathing when they're like, that's what they're playing. That's what the algorithm is designed to do to make you hate yourself more and more and more so that you'll go deeper into this hole. So the first thing is like, I just really try to be tender with the teens. It's really hard to be alive as a, like, as a 15 year old right now. Um, there's a little story that I share in the book, and I wish I could remember who told me this because somebody actually did this some years ago and told me about it, and maybe it was Rachel Naomi Remen. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but um, but it's, a, it's a mother who has one of these kids who just like w completely detached, disengaged, like, f you know, it's, the house is, a la is full of landmines. Like, you, you know, everything's wrong. Okay, I have a breakfast like that with my kids every now and then. Maybe today was one of those days. I don't know, but but like this was a this was to the point of like really m making it hard to be in the house together. And um, and so here's what this mom did. She bought a chocolate babka, and she said to her kid, um, "I have a chocolate babka, and I'm going to be in the kitchen with it at midnight. If you want to come have a snack." And she went and sat in the kitchen, and the kid did not show up. And then the next day said, I'm going to be back there with another chocolate babka <laughs> tomorrow, you know, tonight. And again, the kid didn't show up and basically said, I'm going to be there every single night with the chocolate babka just waiting for you. And after, like, some time passed, like months, at some point at midnight, the kid walked into the kitchen and said, like, Ima, can I have a bite of the chocolate babka? and sat down and they started to connect. And so I think part of what I would recommend is like, so on one hand, it's about tenderness and just like just a little bit for us, the hum for us, the grownups in the room, a little bit the humility to know that, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I didn't talk to my parents that way is fair, um, but, but I wasn't tempted the way that they are. And I wasn't being, act like there were not massive multinational corporations investing lots of money in figuring out how to do damage to my psyche as I was going through my teenage years. That is happening now. A technology can also be used for good, I understand. But, but like there are a lot of forces that are causing damage right now to our children. And so one, be tenderness, but two, just be a, like a consistent loving presence that lets them know that like I'm here when you're ready, when you're ready. And I might have a chocolate babka with me too, <laughs> which might sweeten the deal. I just have one last one because it says, what book do you have on your bedside? I, I, had, I had this book. <laughs> so, um, but it's, it's who, do you, who, who are you reading? Um, well, I, actually, I, I'm, I, I, rec I really have, literally on my bedside, I have a stack of 45 books, but the one on the top is John O'Donohue's book, um, The Book of Blessings, and I just, um, I, it's there because I'm always reading it. Like, I yeah. read it before, after, and in between all the other things yeah. that I'm reading, and sometimes when the world is just stealing my breath, I will literally just open that book and read a blessing of his, and he reminds me that we have the capacity yeah. to bless and to be blessed, yeah. and so that book, it goes with me, Everywhere, like I'll bring that on a short trip. I'll bring it on a long trip. I leave it by the bedside. I mean, it's with me always because I think I need I need a rabbi too, and he's <laughs> and my rabbis are often Catholic, and yeah. so <laughs> I I he's, really he's, uh, he left us too soon. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's he's great. And thank I mean thank God we can still hear the echoes of his wisdom today and. Yeah. Um, and so I do, I draw upon that well. I, I draw from that well again and again and again. I want to, as we bring this to a close um, and acknowledge your mother is here and acknowledge that your father is no longer with us. And can I ask you to kind of close us? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I shared with Father Greg that um, my beloved father, Rick Browse, died 
after I closed the manuscript and before the book came uh, out into the world, he died just before Rosh Hashanah. Some of you were with us for the holidays um, at Ikar. And, um, and I really wrote the book from the vantage point of someone who was used to turning to the right and circling around this way and seeing who was broken and bereaved and bereft. And, um, and then the book came out when I was going this way and just hoping that somebody, somebody would like say amen to my grief. And the community did and has and, and has continued to. And I'm so thankful for that. And I don't know how people navigate grief without, um, without love um, around us. And so, um, so I wanted to close by sharing that um, in chapter one, I describe um, how I got the title for the book, um, which is it's actually based on a, an ancient um, ri ritual that's different from the circling, but that is about uh, mourners standing up in a room full of people and simply saying out loud, essentially in Aramaic, so nobody you know, really understands the words, but what their body is saying is, I'm broken right now. And the whole community responds by saying, amen. And then the person goes on saying like, I don't even know how to make sense of my life without this person, amen. And then, you know, like, and I'm scared I'm gonna forget the sound of his voice. Amen. And so we have, you'll hear in the, in the prayer, you see this repetition of this word, which is shared by Jews and Christians and Muslims and others. And the word just means, I see you. I see you. I cherish you, right? Um, you belong to me and we belong to each other. And so what I wanted to do to close, if it's okay, is I just want to invite if there's anyone else who's mourning in this room, aside from my mom and me, um, if you will stand up in this room, trusting that you are going to be held in a context of love and care. And there's a vulnerability that comes with doing that because you have to really trust that, um, that you'll be met in your sorrow. But, um, but you will be because we're going to do that for each other. And, um, and if it's okay with you, I'm going uh, to say the words of this ancient prayer um, if you're also grieving um, and you know the words, you can feel free to say it with me. And if not, I just, I'm going to just ask if you'll say amen. Um, just, I see you. Um, and in that way, maybe we can, we can start to or continue to train our hearts to actually see, uh, to see one another. So. Yitkadal v'yitkadash shemei rabah. Vialma divra hirate, viam lich mahute, Behaichon, Uviomechon, Ubahaye, the whole Beit Israel, Bagala Uvisman Kariv, Mru, Amen. Yehe shme rabba mavorach, le alamo meomaya. Yit barach, the ishtabach, the it paar, the it roman, the it nasa, the it adar, the it ala, the it halal, shme de kutcha, brehu, le elam in cover hata, vishirata, tush behata, venechamata, da miramba alma, the mru, Amen. Yehe Shlama Rabba Min Shemaya Vachayim Alenu Vako Yisrael Vimru Amen. O se shalom bim Romav Hu Ya Ase Shalom Alenu Vako Yisrael Vimru Amen. And I just I now read um thank you. Um and may your may your loved ones' memories continue to reverberate as a blessing in this world for many years to come. I am trained now to read these um ancient words and these rituals as, as teachers and guides for how we respond to the human condition today. And what I hear from this, amen, 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 is that we have the power to turn to one another with relentless love in a world that is breaking from an intersection of crises. We can turn to each other again and again and again and just say, I see you, I cherish you, and I bless you. And so I just, I bless all of you um, that you feel held and loved uh, and that you know that you have that gift that you can share with others as well. And thank you so much for spending the evening with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this beautiful conversation. And um, please come to the lobby and, and uh, Rabbi Browse will be signing her books. And we also have a reception for everybody here. And um, 
It's wonderful that you've all come, um, and thank you. Thank you for being here. Take care. <laughs>